Welcome to Massive Late Fee. And now your hosts, Mark and Carol. Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Massive Late Fee. My name is Mark. With me as always is my wife, Carol. How are you doing today, Carol? Hey, what's up? It's been a good week. It's August 27th, 1999. We are talking about the muse. We're not doing any news. We're going really fast because it is hot as fuck in here. Yeah, he's talking like the uh, Micro Machine Man there. Okay, or an he auctioneer. Was on, huh? Or an auctioneer, sure. He, he was on... I was trying to do the Micro Machine there. <laughs> but he's like, he went on talking... You know, he did that shit. Uh-huh. He was on uh, an episode of Saved by the Bell. Do you remember that? No. He was one of the teachers or whatever, and they were like, uh, he's like, I'm going to go over all the notes for your, your test, for the history test and everything. All you have to do is follow along with what I say, and you'll uh, be fine. Get oh, ready yeah. to take your notes. And he's like, uh, and like, you know, they cut to like people just furiously scribbling and... Uh, uh, I think smoke was coming up mm-hmm. from somebody's pencil and stuff like that. Yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. Micro Machines guy. He won a contest, I think, for talking fast. Wow. Well, good That's for him. That's how he got to start. Good for him. Let's talk about this weird fucked up movie. The Muse. Did you find it amusing? No. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't find it amusing. I didn't like this movie. No, oh, interesting. Like... At all, it was stupid. We watched a long time ago. We didn't. We didn't talk about it on the show. This was probably prior to us even having a show. But we watched "Defending Your Life," which is a movie written and directed by the same man, Albert Brooks, the uh, the uh, the star of this movie, who also wrote and directed it. You you know Albert Brooks. Mm-hmm. You know his real name? No. Albert Einstein. No. Yep. Why? That's not a joke. His real name is Albert Einstein. Why would his parents do that to him? His brother is named Bob Einstein, but he professionally goes by Super Dave Osborne. <laughs> Super Dave Osborne is Al- uh, Albert Brooks's brother. Interesting. They are brother. Bob, Bob and Albert Einstein. So, uh, as- that's not Ozzy Osborne, is it? Super no. Dave Osborne? No. Okay. What the f- <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> one of them is New York Jewish. The other one is English. I don't know. I don't know anything about names. Oh, my God. Ah, the boys. <laughs> Jesus. Matza, 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 matza. Uh, anyway. Anyway. Funny story about Albert Brooks. He used to, he when he would go to parties, if he got a laugh, like he, you know, he's like comedian dude. Obviously, he would tell jokes and everything. And if he got a big laugh, he would sneak out of the party and leave, not come back, so that that last th- image of him or the last memory that they people had of him was his joke. Wow! And one time he did that, but he left his keys upstairs, and like he went to a payphone and called the the apartment and it was like he you, you sent somebody down to burn my keys wow because he refused to go back into the party what an idiot because he he's albert einstein you can't call him an idiot <laughs> oh yes i can uh but anyway and that that was later uh satirized in the television show seinfeld because i guess him and seinfeld are friends huh? hmm. they were on the the comedy circuit together but anyway albert brooks i think is an interesting filmmaker he came up during the 1970s he made a a movie called real life which is kind of now that i think about it a truman show-esque or a ed tv-esque movie where with charles groden he he is a like the premise of that movie is he's like an indie filmmaker or whatever he comes to charles groden with the idea of filming their family for a year Mm -hmm. and turning it into a movie or whatever. And he puts cameras all around their house to film like actual real life. Interesting idea. Like at TV. Yes. Uh, And then there's, uh, he did defending your life, which we saw. He's done a few other movies. uh, And now the muse. So defending your life was only okay. And the muse sucks. Okay. So defending your life is one of my favorite movies of all time. And to call it only okay 
It's just like I want, I want so badly to do bad things to you. Oh, well, you know, later. Um, <laughs> but right now, let's talk about it. So, you actually like this movie? I'm not saying I like the movie. I'm saying that I like Albert Brooks as a filmmaker, and he does things that are a little off the wall. So it's not his filmmaking that bothered me. It's not the acting that yeah. bothered me. It's the story that bothered me. The screenplay sucks. So I think this movie maybe isn't made for us. Who is it made for? Inside Hollywood people. Okay. I really feel like there are many things that people who are in the movie industry that watch. Like, I think this is for a very, very small audience. Hmm. I think the people that are in the movie industry that watch this are probably laughing their heads off. And I think the rest of America doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that's only a theory I have because I don't know, because I don't get any of the references. So at the very beginning of the movie, he wins this like humanitarian award, some like meaningless like award that they give out. And I think that's probably something like, I, I feel like that's like a punchline. Like okay. whether like the humanitarian award goes to Albert Brooks. But, yeah. You know, like, like I've never heard of it. Whatever you have. Whatever is, I haven't heard of it either, but what, whatever his name is. Right. I feel like people in the industry would be like, Oh my God, he's getting that. That's the, you never won an Oscar. Fuck you award or whatever. Probably something like that. And then he and his wife, Andy McDowell, who is, Fairly criminally underused in this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, drives, they drive home and they drive past the sign, uh, Pal the Palisades, Palisades Park or whatever, where they live, right? In the Palisades. Mm -hmm. I've heard of the Palisades. I don't know enough about California geography to find this funny, but it was filmed like a joke. Okay. And, like everything about the way, the way the sign is framed, them driving past it, all that stuff. It's set up like that sign is a joke, but I don't get the joke. Right. I've heard people talk about the valley and stuff like that. I maybe that's maybe that's in the valley. I don't know. I don't even know what's wrong with the valley. <laughs> right. I don't know enough about California geography to find it funny, but I'm guessing that because he doesn't live in Brentwood or like Brentwood's where uh, Anna, Anna I almost said Anna Nicole Smith where uh Anna Nicole Simpson lived where she got killed or whatever, right? Rockingham or whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, because it's not Brentwood, because it's not Beverly Hills, because it's not like one of those big posh like Orange County neighborhoods. That's my guess is that like, oh, it's a joke that he lives here. This is just a fucking regular house in California, which, by the way, has its own guest house. <laughs> it's like, obviously, they're doing well. Right. I mean, they, or at least they were. He keeps saying that he doesn't have enough money to take a year off. Yet he has enough money to put up Sharon Stone at the Plaza Hotel or whatever, the Beverly Hilton or whatever it is, for $7,000 a night? Yeah. Yeah, so let's... let's the, their definition of not enough money is not... An, and that's another thing that I think doesn't work about this movie. This movie's disconnected from the rest of humanity. Right. Yeah, so he apparently sucks at writing. Now he does. And He's lost his edge. People can, and that's another thing that I think's a joke. People keep telling him, "I, you know, you, I've lost you. You've lost your edge." He keeps hearing the same like note. That's like a nebulous. What the fuck does that even mean? Kind of note. Mm -hmm. And and it's like I think this movie is like supposed to be very cutting about Hollywood. And about the actual process of making movies. I think this, and I think the whole muse thing is also part of that. That it's just like, and the fact that, spoilers for the end of this movie, you don't need to see the movie, but spoilers for the end of the movie, she's not real. She, I mean, she's real, but she's not really a muse. Everyone in Hollywood is fucking convinced she's uh, somehow some magical goddess and shit like that that has muse powers. And guess what? She's just another fraudster. I think that's part of the biting criticism against Hollywood. But the problem with this movie, and we'll get into the details in a minute, but I, I just want to talk about, I just want to talk about my overall, like, overarching thoughts of the structure of this. Mm -hmm. The problem with this movie 
is that Albert Brooks is our everyman character, and he can play a good everyman, but he's not playing an everyman in this movie. He's part of the system. Yeah. When when he he says stuff like I keep hearing I'm losing my edge. What what does that mean? Like that's him trying to be like the everyman character, but he's too locked into everything. And his character, as written, and I mean Albert Brooks is in real life too. His character is written is written as too locked into the system. We need a very outside the system kind of person. We need like his character should have been somebody that got super lucky and got like a spec script that he sent off to uh, Paramount or something like that, that somehow got made and became like a huge movie. And he had like two, two hits after that. And he's recently moved with his family to Hollywood, but he's still very much on the outside. And now he's hearing all these bad things about his new scripts and everything. And he, and he's like now getting like his first real look at the way Hollywood works, because then his character can naturally ask questions and things can be explained to the audience that we don't get. Right. This movie's too insular. It's too, it's too inside Hollywood to be funny to anyone outside of Hollywood. Yeah. Agreed. And like the end of the movie, when we find out that the muse isn't really the muse, uh, and she's supposed to be like, what, like an agent or something. She, she got, so and she, ta- but she br- she runs down the hall with him. She grabs him. She's pulling him down the hall. What was that? I was so confused. I don't even know what the fuck was happening at the end of this movie. At the end of the movie, the guy that he's been working with, the producer that he's been working with at Paramount, I don't know exactly what all the different types of producers are, but he's a guy that greenlights projects, I guess, or whatever. Right? He's been fired because he's been stealing movie props for many years. <laughs> And she has convinced everyone, she's changed her name, changed her hair, and convinced everyone that she's somehow a big movie producer, and she got his job, and she's green lighting his, his movie, the one he wrote when she was his quote-unquote muse. So that's, that's what happened at the end of the movie, and they're going to lunch to talk about it. So that's what happened at the end of the movie is that she she like conned her way into this job because she has mental problems. She's a mm-hmm. mental patient who apparently has a, a disassociative identity disorder or whatever they call it. Multiple personalities, yeah. Yeah. So she has multiple personalities and she, this is another personality, I guess, that's manifested itself. But she's very good at tricking people into thinking she ha- is who she says she is. So, like, the the backstory of her character, I guess, because, like I said, spoilers, she's not really a muse, but everyone in Hollywood thinks she is a muse. She thinks she's one of the daughters of Zeus. And she says she, her her father was Zeus. And these people fucking believe it. And... Like, I think the backstory of it has to be super interesting. She she found somebody powerful enough in Hollywood that she, she like, somehow conned her way into a party, started telling some, some director or something or writer this, and he was, and he bought it. Like, he fucking mm-hmm. bought it up. And, and because he believed it and used her and maybe he had a hit or something like that, just whatever, out of spur of the moment, maybe it was Rob Reiner. It's implied that Rob Reiner was one of the first. Yeah. Um, so she must have got to him before North, I guess. Uh, um, but uh, anyway, so like he bought it. And then because he bought it, everyone else started believing it too. And that's basically because just Jeff Bridges is Albert Brooks's friend. Although it's not Jeff Bridges. He's playing a character in this movie. But it's Albert Brooks's friend. And oh, I should point out, I keep calling him Albert Brooks. I can't remember the kiss character's name. He is also playing a character. He's not playing Albert Brooks. Because mm-hmm. he sometimes does play himself in movies. But yeah, no. Um, I, mostly mostly people are playing characters, but there are some people that gets confusing too. Some people yeah. are playing themselves. Yeah, so. Rob Reiner plays himself. Martin Scorsese comes over, coked up and plays himself. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of cameos from 
And that's another thing, too, that I think, like, people are like, oh, my friend. You're like, you know, people inside Hollywood, that's probably what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, there's a lot of cameos from, like, directors, writers, stuff like that, that want her, her musability. And, anyway, so she doesn't do anything. She just gets gifts. And she, like, makes the person put her up in hotels, guest houses, stuff like that. Reminds me of a dragon player. She just has a, a pile of yes. presents, and they're yes. and they're all like jewelry from Tiffany's. Yeah, exactly. It has to be Tiffany's, and she doesn't even open the box when he gives her a present because she has so much shit. So she's very she's beautiful because it's Sharon Stone. You know, mm. she's beautiful and charming, and that is enough. It doesn't matter that she has no education or whatever. At one point. Jeff Daniels' character is like, yeah, oh, she's a muse, you know, or whatever. Like, she can uh, she can trace her family back all the way to the beginning of, like, civilization or time or whatever. And I'm like, I, I said this out loud mm-hmm. in the theater. We all can. <laughs> like, all of us can. I mean, like, you might not know what all the people are, but we all started together. Yeah. it's That was a very stupid statement. It's not like just one day, like, my dad just fucking spontaneously appeared right. out of nowhere. So anyway, um, she uh, she's charming enough to convince enough people, and then it snowballs, and then everyone believes in. But it's a ridiculous thing to believe. Yeah. That she's literally a muse. I mean, we kind of buy it as the audience because it's a movie, so we're primed to believe right. things that aren't true. I remember saying to you, I was like, in real life, I would be very skeptical well, of this of person. But yeah, I mean, it's suspension of disbelief. It's a movie. And it's it's kind of like almost to me like a mystery throughout the movie as to whether or not she's really the muse, like waiting to, for, the, for the reveal. But it was disappointing as hell the way they did it. See, I was surprised. I was actually surprised that she wasn't a muse. That caught me off guard. Hmm. It didn't catch me off guard. You were I, waiting for it the whole time, huh? Yeah. Um, as and then like, you know, the they come looking from like the psych hospital looking for her. Right. But that's still not the end of it. No. Like that's what's crazy to me. Like it still continues on after that. Well, and the idea that he gets is like I don't know, it's so weird because she's just like, Hey, let's go down to the aquarium. And he's like, All right. And then he comes up with an idea. About Jim Carrey buying an aquarium mm-hmm. and how hilarious that would be. I I don't know. I, I can't tell you. I feel like it had to suck because otherwise, you know, they'd be giving away good insider movie That's true. stuff. Yeah, so. yeah in, a, in, a, in a movie or a book, like, yeah, the ideas, the fake ideas are always not great because you would use a real idea. Right. So, yeah, I don't think we'll ever see a movie where Jim Carrey owns an aquarium. But No. That's okay. I'm okay with it's that. It's funny. Yeah. It'd be like, I don't know, if one of the kids from Goodwill Hunting like owned a zoo or something <laughs> like that. Stupid. Right. Uh, but anyway, so like, I uh, I don't know. Like, it, I didn't hate it because I liked Albert Brooks and I liked Sharon Stone and I liked their interactions and I thought they had good like give and take with each other. Chemistry wise, I do think that Andy McDowell was completely underutilized. Well, and I mean, towards the end of the movie, she gets used more because, you know, it brings in that the muse is like affecting their marriage. She can't sleep in the guest house. Like, they moved her into the guest room. Yeah. And she can't. Not the guest room, the, the entire oh, the guest, guest house. house. She can't sleep there. So then she moves into their marital bed, and, and Andy McDowell thinks that she's going to share it with her, but she's not. <laughs> right. Um, and she looks disappointed. Yeah. And then she convinces her to make her own cookies and, and sells them to Wolfgang Puck. She asks her, what do you what do you do? What are you good at or whatever? Mm-hmm. And she says, I'm good at making cookies. Like, it's the one thing I got from my mom and her grandmother or whatever. Like, we make delicious cookies and everything. And so she starts making cookies and Sharon sounds like, awesome. Let's go and talk to Wolfgang. Because she knows Wolfgang Puck. That's the thing that she gives them is access. Because mm-hmm. she knows so many people. Yeah. And Wolfgang Puck's like, these are awesome. Let's make them. We're going to make you the next Mrs. Fields. And she ends up opening her own shop and becomes 
hugely successful and everything. Yeah, so, I mean, at least something good came out of it, I guess, for her. He also gets his script written. Oh, yeah, because she's going to green light it. Yeah, because at the end, it's like... I thought this was really dumb, too, especially because they reverse it immediately. It's like he writes the script, his agent looks at it, he's like, yeah, it's awesome. Rob Reiner wrote the exact same script. Mm -hmm. How? Because she, they were both at the, the aquarium together and everything, and she talked to him and stuff like that. Did she tell him the ideas? I think she did. So he, maybe he was looking for more Muse stuff, and Albert Brooks had come up with these, these ideas, and she gave them to him. Yeah, yeah, that's probably what happened. Okay, I was confused about that. But anyway, they have it to where Rob Reiner steals his idea, and it's like, oh, fuck, you know, like... What was the point of this whole fucking movie? Mm-hmm. But then uh, the studio that Rob Reiner's working for is like, we're not going to make the movie. We don't want to make this movie. And she is greenlighting his. So it doesn't matter that he stole it because that movie's never going to get made. His is going to get made instead. Yeah. So I, I agree it was stupid because they just undid it. Yeah, they undid it immediately. It's like you think, like, oh, fuck, and he's and he's working at her cookie shop and everything. It looks like he's completely defeated, and he hates himself. Yeah. But then he gets this great gift. He's, he's in the writing business again. Why does he need to even work at the shop? Why? Like, they have so much fucking money. That's the thing. I think that Albert Brooks thinks, when he's writing this script, well, I've got a smaller house. It's only, like, four bedrooms in the Palisades in California, and we only have a smallish guest house, not a big guest house. Uh, so we're poor, essentially. Like, that's not poor. <laughs> I, they, they, like, like I said, this, this movie, and I mean, I don't think it's done by design. If it's done by design, it doesn't exactly work. If, it's, if, if the fact that even the movie itself is very inaccessible mm-hmm. to people outside of the Hollywood like industry, if that's also part of the the point of the movie, to be like, hey, the, the movie industry is so insular, you can't even understand this film. Like, yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think it was on purpose. Even if it was that, that meta, that Andy Kaufman meta, then uh, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't work. No. Really. But I, I like the idea of making a movie about a con artist, essentially, that infiltrates Hollywood because, and, and, and how that points out that all of Hollywood is fucking make-believe. Yeah. <laughs> that it's all razzmatazz, it's all, it doesn't matter, all that shit, right? And to show all the ridiculousness of the Hollywood system, that's a good idea for a movie, but this doesn't quite hit the mark. And like I said, to me... The biggest reason is because it's too up its own ass. It's too, it's too much. These references that most people are not going to get. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I didn't get much of the movie. I didn't like most of the movie. There were scene. There were individual scenes I liked. There were individual scenes I liked that I thought were funny. Um, I think that Albert Brooks was like, I want to be in a scene with Martin Scorsese. I want to be in a scene with Rob Reiner. I want to be like, you know, like he just picked people that he wanted to be in scenes with or Mm -hmm. people that he's friends with. And he's like, come on down. Yep. I'm surprised that Holly Hunter wasn't there. She, they were in network uh, broadcast news together. But yeah, don't waste your time. It sucked. Unless of course you're a Hollywood insider. So then, you know, go ahead and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Yeah, If you're a Hollywood insider that is jaded at, your industry, go watch it. Other than that, I don't think it's really worth it. Yeah, don't waste your time. Unfortunately, there are many better Albert Brooks movies. See, uh, watch um, Defending Your Life. It's a great movie, despite what someone thinks. <laughs> Only okay. That is the episode for today. Carol, people tell uh, Carol tell people <laughs> where to find their own muse. You can write us at latefee1994 at AOL.com. Yep. You can check out our website at www.retrolatefee.com yep. and share the tapes with your friends. Yep, I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.